Hi guys, Matt Easton here. A lot of times on the videos that I've made over the last couple of years, people have requested that I make more videos about armour. In fact, I do have quite a lot of things to say about armour, um, but for the large part, the reason I don't make more videos about armour is because it's a bit of a pain in the ass to put armour on in general. I do own a full plate harness and I own mail. What I'm going to do in this video is talk a little bit, introductory stuff, about mail, often known as chain mail. Um, now first up, the terminology chain mail. So everyone will say that chain mail is a modern or at least Victorian um, expression for male armour and historically it was known as male or Bernie or um, uh, Hawbuck, these different names for the, the, the garment that we now know as a chain mail shirt. Um, I'm actually not too fussy about that. If you want to call it chainmail, call it chainmail. The fact is that everybody now, nowadays knows what chainmail is, so being pedantic about mail, spelt with two L's and an E at the end, I think is a little bit of an, uh, a kind of anachronistic, I think it's kind of needless pedantry. Uh, and if we call it a chainmail shirt, then everyone knows what we're talking about. And the most important thing is that people know that what we're talking about. So, what am I wearing? I am wearing what was commonly known in the Anglo-Saxon or early medieval period as a Bernie or uh, a Hawbuck. It is a shirt made of mail. I'm holding the shield for no particular reason other than to point out that um, the mail shirt was an incredibly important defensive armour used from antiquity, from essentially what we'd know as the Roman, Roman period. In fact, it was probably originally a Celtic uh, invention, although the term Celtic itself is a fairly loose term that describes quite a lot of people from a large area. Um, but certainly the Romans adopted male armour and used it extensively. In fact, a lot of people, when they think of a Roman soldier, think of the plate armour, uh, overlapping plates known as um, lorica segmentata. In fact, uh, male armour was worn by Roman soldiers for a longer period of time, both before and after the famous plated lorica. Um, and this, this type of, I believe it was male uh, uh, lorica hamata, is what male shirt was known uh, in Roman period, was worn in the late Roman period and in the early Roman period. Uh, so in actual fact it was the most common form of uh, armour. I'll just whip off the shield here. Right, so, what have we got? We have interlinking rings. So, I expect most of you are completely, absolutely familiar with what mail or chain mail is. It's uh, a one in four rings, that is each one of these rings connects to four rings around it. Okay, and that's essentially how the mesh is made up. The majority of mail from around the world is made like that. Um, in Japan they had slightly different mail that I believe was one in six, which is quite unusual. Um, the individual rings, now this is made so that every ring is riveted. Okay, and that's uh, a fairly labour intensive way of making mail, but it was historically used certainly in Europe for a wide period of time. Another way of making mail that you can potentially uh, make the mail slightly stronger and save yourself manufacturing time is to have alternating riveted rings with solid rings. And of course the weak point in any riveted ring is the point at which it's riveted. Now, some people might dispute that. Some people might say that in actual fact the thicker portion where you've got the overlapping ends with the rivet through is actually a strong point in the mail. I'm not so sure. When I've seen uh, mail tested by various weapons, uh, and, uh, and I must caveat that with it's modern made mail and it's not always the most authentic mail that you can get, but when I've seen modern riveted mail tested by weapons, usually the point at which it fails is the rivet point. Okay? Usually what happens is where you've got these two overlapping, overlapping ends, so they come around that overlap and then a rivet goes through, what happens is that where the hole for the rivet goes through one of those ends, it often shears and so that end comes apart and essentially the mail bursts. Okay, so it's often when mail fails, it's not so much that it's, it can be sheared or cut, um, but usually what happens is it bursts and when it bursts the rivet goes or at least the, the hole around the rivet breaks 
and the ring springs open. And actually, sometimes, not always, sometimes you only need one ring in, um, in the male to burst to actually create a big enough hole for something like a sword point or a dagger point or a spear point or an arrow, in fact, to go through. Um, now, the next thing to mention is that male, modern made male, like this, is usually of uniform um, size in terms of the rings. The rings are usually, say, six or eight millimeter rings uh, all over. Historically, male was actually made so that it was stronger in some parts and lighter in others. If you use a bigger ring, it's got more space and less metal on that part of the area, okay, on that area of the male. So you're actually making the male lighter by having bigger rings because uh, you're covering more area with less metal. However, by using bigger rings, very clearly you make a bigger hole for a weapon to penetrate, but also you mean, it means that that area is somewhat weaker. So just like with everything, it's a trade-off, it's a compromise. Usually what you take away in weight, in other words you make it lighter, but you tend to make it weaker. Um, and that's definitely true with mail in general. So what you'll often find actually on, if you look at an original uh, 13th, 14th, 15th century mail fragment, is that very often you'll find um, there's areas of concentrated male where the male is essentially thicker uh, or the rings are smaller um, in areas where you most need it. In other words, on the front, you know, the front of the chest, maybe along the uh, top of the shoulders, that kind of area. Um, whereas as you get down to, you probably can't see in the video, but as you get down to pull it up the skirts, which come down here, the lower parts, or indeed the armour on the back, then it can afford to be thinner. You can use light, larger rings that will make the shirt somewhat lighter, um, which is obviously a good thing. In terms of weight, I actually can't remember how much this weighs. Um, at a guess, uh, probably about 20 pounds. Um, maybe between 10 and no, maybe less than that. Maybe maybe 15 pounds, something like that. Um, and so it's not it's not heavy. I mean, you could wear this all day and not not you know not be worried about it. Um, however, uh, it is a weight, it is something, you, it's like carrying a heavy backpack, it is certainly something that over the course of the day might fatigue you, and might potentially, does it make you any slower? Well it doesn't make me any slower in the arms, because I don't happen to have any mail, I, this shirt finishes it, um, up here, like a long t-shirt. Um, if it was coming full arm length, then yes, it would probably make my arms a little bit more cumbersome and a little bit slower. Um, but in terms of on my feet, I think I can probably move around on my feet as quickly as I could. And in fact, in HEMA, when we're wearing all our protective gear, padded jackets, masks, and everything else, that's a weight anyway. So that kind of, you, if you're used to that, then wearing a male shirt shouldn't be any problem. In terms of weight, um, there's another thing which a lot of people will probably have already noticed that I'm not wearing a belt. If you put a belt tight around the middle, what it has the benefit of doing is it means that you're essentially halving the amount of weight that's hanging off your shoulders. A male shirt as it is at the moment, just worn as a shirt, dumped over my head, all of the weight is hanging off my shoulders. If I put a belt around the middle and do it up tight, what I'm now doing is all of the male shirt that's below the height of that belt now essentially hangs via friction from my waist. So I'm halving the weight that my shoulders are taking. However, it wasn't always, and in fact it was quite common to not wear a belt around the middle. If you look at historical artwork, you can see lots of um, examples of people wearing male shirts with no belt around the middle. But equally, if you're wearing armour over the top of this, maybe a coat of plates or a breastplate or whatever, it might just not be practical to have a belt underneath because it would conflict with what you then wear over the top. Um, so, long story short, uh, male shirts often weren't worn with a belt around the middle, although lots of reenactors would go, oh, you should wear a belt around the middle, it, it makes it lighter on your shoulders. Yes, that is true, it, it, it makes it lighter on your shoulders, but for various reasons, often you don't want to wear a belt around the middle of your male shirt. One of the things about male that people often don't necessarily comment on or think about is actually it's very quick and easy to get on and off. What we've got is a one-piece defence um, that protects all of my torso, all the way down to my mid-thighs, protects my groin, very important, um, and it protects half my arms. And 
I can just dump this on and take it off really, really easily. Um, and at the end, in fact, I will take the shirt off to show you how quickly I can, I can get it off. And putting armour on and taking it off is actually really, really important. Again, we come back to my favourite word, context. Okay? And um, there are various periods in history where soldiers have been issued with pieces of armour which during campaigning they abandoned because they were so inconvenient. Either because they were uncomfortable or too heavy or too hot, in the case of South America for example, um, or, um, or just they took too long to take off and put on. Uh, and in fact we know that on the Agincourt campaign in 1415 that the English men-at-arms kept their armour on and there's descriptions of them being covered in rust as a result. Um, and this was because they knew they could be attacked at any time and they wanted to be fully armoured up. However, it's incredibly uncomfortable and fatiguing to go around all the time with plate armour on. Male shirt, absolutely fine. A male shirt is quite light, it breathes, it, you don't get any hotter in a male shirt than you would do uh, in anything else. Uh, you know, with nothing, with nothing else because the male shirt doesn't add anything or it doesn't uh, restrict the heat escaping. Um, and it, in fact it doesn't prevent the heat from coming in as well, it's just nothing really, it's just a mesh, just a net. Um, so mail is comfortable and not particularly heavy and very quick to get on and off. Something else that we should definitely say in an introductory video talking about mail is the fact that you'll notice I'm wearing underneath a gambeson. Now, Gambesons weren't always worn underneath mail. For example, we know in the Roman era they wore mail, uh, apparently over some kind of uh, linen shirt, probably. Um, certainly if we look at um, the Bayer Tapestry, thousand years later, we see uh, mail shirts being pulled off and no evidence of there being gambesons underneath whatsoever. Although that might be an artistic license, or, and this is another theory that I am actually fairly convinced by, um, that there may have been some kind of garment attached to the mail, stitched to the mail on the, on the inside. So when you take the mail off, you also take the garments with it, under, uh, like, a, like a lining off at the same time. Um, but, you know, in, in the Anglo-Saxon and Viking era, we've got almost no evidence of gambeson-like clothing, really. Um, so it seems that they just chucked mail shirts on over their clothes, or maybe just over a woolen, a woolen tunic. Um, now, uh, mail works far more effectively when it's over a padded garment. Okay? This has been, there have been experiments done by the Royal Armouries in Leeds where they uh, shot mail shirts with arrows and hit them with axes and stuff like this and swords. Um, and it's been demonstrated that if you have padding underneath the mail, you get a massive amount more shock absorbency and therefore the mail is less likely to fail under pressure. However, we know that for a long period of time they wore mail without padding underneath. Um, why? We don't know. Maybe they just hadn't thought to make padded stuff to go underneath yet. Um, maybe heat was an issue. Um, certainly, in fact, what I'm wearing at the moment, a gambeson and a mail shirt, the most uncomfortable or the most fatiguing part of what I'm wearing in terms of heat, certainly, is the gambeson. It's not the mail, it's the, it's the, the padding underneath is what will make me hot. Um, and we know equally that in India and the Middle East, um, in Persia um, and Afghanistan and such like, we know that male shirts were worn just over their clothes, okay, with no padding underneath. So a lot of people will say, oh, male has to be worn over padding. That's not true, okay? In lots of periods of history, all over the world, male was just chucked over um, whatever you wore otherwise, okay, your clothes, essentially. Now, in terms of male, is it good as a defensive armour? Well, people often compare it with plate armour. Now remember that mail was around for a huge period of time before large plates were developed as plate armour. If we put the uh, Roman lorica segmentata aside for a second, because obviously that's an early appearance of essentially plate armour, um, and it was really only the Roman Empire that could muster the resources to make this kind of armour. Most other cultures in the world, until about... Uh, about 30, well, 12 to 1300 AD, relied on male armour. Male armour defended people right the way through the sort of you know Viking era, the Migration era, the Mi uh, Viking era, the Crusading era, right the way really up to the 13th century when we start to see the coat of plates appear. Um, 
So mail was clearly regarded as a good enough protection for knights and for Vikings and for all of these people and for um, uh, you know sort of soldier warriors in the Middle East and, and, and uh, Mamluk warriors in North Africa. It was regarded as a good enough armour for them for a very long time and it was used alongside lamella armour so it was clearly regarded as as good as or at least maybe not functioning in the same way but to an equal extent to lamella armour and in many ways male armour is harder to wear, it takes longer to make. But the virtues of male armour are, it doesn't make you hot, it gives you absolute complete mobility, um, it it's, doesn't restrict your movement in any way, which anything which is made of plates does. Okay? Even uh, lamellar armour does restrict your movement. Certainly once we get into plate armour, I mean a lot of people will uh, accentuate that plate armour is lighter and more manoeuvrable than maybe Hollywood makes out, However, plate armour is restrictive and is very hot. Okay? Male armour is neither of those things. Male is a very convenient thing to wear um, and it's incidentally also easy to transport. Once you take it off, you can stick it in a bag, hopefully have a bit of oil on it so it doesn't get rusty and bam, there you go. It's in a bag, you can carry it around, you can throw it on your horse, you can put it in a wagon, you can throw it into a ship's hold. Easy. Okay? Much it's much easier and more convenient than plate armour in all sorts of ways. Um, however, what male armour is not as good at, as plate armour and in fact as lamellar armour at <coughs> is preventing penetration from points. Now, in terms of cutting, I'll just talk about cutting first. Male armour is excellent at resisting cuts from um, swords and edged weapons. Okay? First of all, so it's, that is what it absolutely excels at, is preventing cutting. What it's not so good at is absorbing shock from blows, from uh, something like a war hammer. I'm going to grab the uh, war hammer off the, off the wall. First of all, it does absorb some shock. Okay? So by its very mass and the fact that you've got a weave, a mesh, a shock absorbent mesh that's all links connected to each other, it does absorb, ow, that hurt a bit, it does absorb some force, especially when worn over a gambeson, of course, because the two things work together. However, it's not fantastic at absorbing force and it is no coincidence that once we get into the head to foot uh, male era of the sort of 12th to 13th centuries where you see knights in armour, full, full length sleeves, full uh, length legs which are known as chausses uh, and a big great helm. You'll notice in that era what becomes suddenly very popular? Maces, war hammers and battle axes and the reason is that type of pure striking force is effective against someone wearing mail. Um, you're going to break bones, you're going to stun them, disable them, um, even just, you know, bruise them so badly that they can't fight anymore. Um, so striking weapons are, are pretty effective against male. Um, <clears throat> and that might be incidentally, in fact it almost certainly is, why we see in the Viking era, moving up to the kind of uh, Battle of Hastings 1066 era, we notice an increase, more or less, in the use of axes. And this is probably why, it's because um, for centuries during the migration era, the predominant weapons were spears and swords and saxes. Um, and what they found is as male armour became more predominant in the Viking era and towards 1000 AD, um, actually things like maces, which are pictured in the Bayer Tapestry, um, maces and axes became more useful against people wearing a lot of armour male at that time, and of course a helmet. So striking weapons are effective against male, however, male is certainly better than not wearing male. I would not be doing this to myself if I wasn't wearing male over my gabazon, because it would be quite hurting. Okay? Um, so male is effective to a degree at taking striking, but <clears throat> definitely hitting someone with a heavy percussive weapon is more effective than trying to cut them with a the sword, for example. Next up, swords and uh, points, spears, swords um, and daggers to an extent as well and indeed the points of war hammers and things like this and you'll notice that axes in the uh, kind of 12th century, 13th century start to very commonly get spikes on the back so you've got an axe blade 
and a spike on the back, and that's probably also an anti-armor um, thing. Um, now, male is actually better than some people assume at resisting piercing from a point. Okay? Um, clearly, the best thing you can do to get through mail, if you have to get through it rather than bypass it, and remember always with armour, the best thing is hit someone somewhere where the armour isn't. So hit them in the leg, hit them in the, in the arm, get a point inside uh, underneath the, the, the mail, or hit them in the face, or you know, all of these gaps that you've got in the armour are the best things to hit. But if you have to hit someone in armour, in other words, if you're shooting arrows at them, or you're doing um, shield and spear, for example, and you're just hitting whatever you can, you can't be that precise about precisely where you get the point of your spear. Um, thrusting, or the use of a point, is, generally speaking, the best thing to do against male, in my opinion, and based on the experiments that I've seen as well. <coughs> so, um, points can, as I mentioned, sometimes burst the link and therefore wound the person. However, uh, and again, this is, uh, there's been a swinging back and forth. So it seemed to be in the old days, everyone went, oh, well, piercing weapons would just go straight through mail, and that's why plate armor was invented. That's not true, okay? In actual fact, mail is still fairly good at resisting points. Generally speaking, a spear thrust um, or a, a thrust from a sword or a dagger, or indeed uh, an arrow with certain types of um, arrowhead, simply won't go through mail kind of three times out of five. Okay? Um, and it will only slightly compromise the mail one time out of five, and then the remaining one time out of five, it might actually wound the person slightly. However, remember, if you burst one ring and the point goes in, often it won't go in as deep as it would have done, if you, obviously, if you weren't wearing mail, because um, it's all about physics, it's all about energy transference, and a lot of the energy of that weapon, whether it's handheld or shot, a lot of the energy of that weapon is expended on breaking the armour in this case, and therefore isn't going to penetrate into your body as deeply. Um, and it's not just breaking the armour, even if it breaks a link, often the hole that remains will still provide friction to the weapon entering. So even if I thrust a sword into someone wearing mail and I break one of the rings and my point starts to go into their body, my blade still is too wide usually to get past the other rings around that hole and they will bind against it and hold it back. So it's very important, this is something in a lot of, uh, I see in a lot of, certainly on YouTube videos, but even on the kind of official kind of Royal Armourers type videos of weapon testing. When they compromise an armour, be it mail or plate, with any type of weapon, be it an arrow or a sword, very often they compromise it and they say, oh, we made a hole in the armour. But then you look at the depth of penetration of the weapon, and it's, it wouldn't have put the person out of action. They would have gone, ow, and that would have been it. They would have then carried on fighting. Armour is very effective. Male armour was in use for a long time for a good reason. So, it is probably fair to say that male armour is best at defending against cuts, um, and it is, it, it is better than nothing at defending against impact blows. In fact, I would go as far as to say it's reasonable at defending against impact blows. And male armour can and often does resist piercing blows as well. In fact, most of the time it resists spears and arrows and things like this. Um, and it's only sometimes that the point compromises the mail. If you are trying to defeat someone wearing mail armour, always, like with all armour, the best thing to do is aim at the places the armour isn't. Okay? Um, but uh, certainly piercing the armour is a very good option. Um, and obviously points that are optimised for piercing. There are certain types of arrowhead, certain types of warhammer and poleaxe, and indeed sword and spearheads that are optimised for bursting mail rings. Um, they are your best option. And blunt trauma, just hitting the armour on, obviously aim for bony parts, okay, where the collarbone joins the, joins the shoulder, um, obviously elbows, um, and indeed um, at the kind of heart and lungs area as well for just shocking a person, winding a person, something like this. Into the stomach, remember of course a blunt blow into the stomach. Uh, the male will perfectly resist, but you can still wind the person. Um, so think about offending the person inside the armour and think about their anatomy. Um, but 
ultimately, the upshot of what the main point I want to make is that mail was in use for a huge period of time because it worked. Mail armour is really, really good and it's uh, easy to wear, it doesn't make you hot, it's easy to store, it's quick to take on and off, um, so it's a very convenient armour. And remember that mail armour stayed in use, even mail shirts by themselves stayed in use right the way through to the Renaissance. It was never really replaced by other types of armour, it just stayed in use alongside other types of armour or was augmented by other types of armour. Okay, so mail armour is fantastic. And now, as promised, uh, just to finish off, I'm going to show, hopefully, how relatively quickly, if I want to, I can get a uh, mail shirt off. So you won't be able to see me for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kneel down and put my head on the ground as if I was um, praying, essentially. Okay, and then I pull the back of my shirt over my head. So, here we go. Ta-da! <laughs> mail shirt off. And um, you cannot do it like anywhere near as quick as that with plate armour. Plate armour takes quite a while to get on and off and very often with many pieces of the armour you need someone else to help you. Mail shirt I can put on, take off myself very quickly, very easily. Thanks guys!